Thank you so much, um, Teres Hanna. Um, it's uh, great to be uh, back in Helsinki and great to be at the Samak meeting. Uh, I, I, I feel among friends, I feel among uh, colleagues, and I feel that I'm attending a kind of uh, family gathering of my political family, and it's uh, some years since last time, so it's really great to see you uh, all. Um, I attended my first uh, uh, meeting of this uh, Forum, uh, the, the Nordic Social Democratic Parties and the Trade Unions, when I was newly elected uh, leader of the uh, AOF for the Young Social Democratic Party in Norway in 1985. That was at Bommersvik, and, uh, and it was Olof Palme that uh, welcomed us all there. Uh, and then it, I think it was Kalvi Soysa from Finland, and it was uh, Anke Jørgensen from Denmark, uh, and then and then Jon Hannibal Hannibalsson from, uh, from Iceland, uh, a great guy, uh, and, then, and then of course Gro Harlem Brundtland. Uh, and uh, since then, together with Gudmundur, we have uh, attended uh, yeah, uh, different summer meetings for almost 30 years, and then I had a break for uh, almost 10 years now. So it's great to be back, and, and really I, I was very pleased when I was invited, uh, and normally we spend a lot of time considering whether I have time, but actually, I just decided that this, uh, we just have to find time to go to the Samok meeting in, in Helsinki and to meet uh, with uh, all you. So thank you so much for inviting me. It is also fitting that we are meeting uh, today in Helsinki, a city that has helped to shape the foundations of uh, European security. The Helsinki Final Act helped uh, reduce Cold War tensions by encouraging uh, cooperation and embedding the principles of freedom and human rights. 35 uh, countries from North America and uh, Europe signed the Helsinki Final Act, the Soviet Union uh, included, committing to uh, settle disputes peacefully, respect sovereign borders and refrain, uh, refrain from the threat or the use of uh, force. President Putin has now shattered these uh, principles. We may be shocked by the brutality of the war against Ukraine, but we should not be surprised. This is part of a pattern of Russian aggression over many years. In Grozny, in Georgia, in Aleppo, in Crimea and Donbass, and now a full-fledged invasion uh, of Ukraine. <clears throat> NATO allies shared intelligence, precise intelligence, uh, about Moscow's plans for an invasion many months ahead. We made every effort to engage in diplomatic and political dialogue with Russia to prevent the war. But despite our calls, President Putin chose to attack. One year on, Putin is not preparing for peace. He is preparing for more war. So while the fighting continues, we can already now draw some lessons uh, of the war. First, we must sustain and step up our support to Ukraine. Russia is launching new offensives, mobilizing more troops, and reaching out to North Korea and Iran to get more weapons. We are also increasingly concerned that China may be planning to provide lethal support for Russia's war. So we must give Ukraine what they need to prevail. I welcome the significant support Nordic countries uh, are delivering to Ukraine. This is making a difference on the battlefield every day, and I thank all the Nordic countries for their support. Together, NATO uh, allies are providing well over 100 billion euros to Ukraine. We must now urgently deliver on our pledges of training and heavy weaponry so that key capabilities can reach Ukraine before Russia can seize the momentum. I hear concerns that our support um, increases the risk of escalation. But as long as our biggest neighbor is willing to invade another country, there are no risk-free options. So let there be no doubt, the biggest risk of all is if President Putin wins in Ukraine. 
if he wins, it will show authoritarian leaders that aggression works and force is rewarded. That will make the world more dangerous and us more vulnerable. So supporting Ukraine is not only the morally right thing to do, it is also in our own security interest. We do not know when this war will end, but when it does, we must ensure that history does not repeat itself. President Putin cannot continue to chip away at European security. We must break the cycle of Russian aggression. Meaning we must enable Ukraine to deter and defend against future aggression. We must put in place long-term arrangements for Ukraine's security because Ukraine's future is in the Euro-Atlantic family. The second lesson is that we must continue to strengthen our deterrence and defense. As Nordic countries, and in particular as Nordic social democrats, we have tried to live peacefully alongside our largest neighbor for decades. At the end of the Cold War, many of us in this room believed we could build a better relationship with Russia me included. And I still believe it was the right thing to do, to, to seize the historic moment to build better security in Europe together with Russia. But President Putin chose to walk away from cooperation and dialogue. He has left a trail of broken promises, shattered fundamental principles of global security, attacking neighboring countries, and try to undermine our own democracies. The latest example is uh, Russia suspending the New START Treaty, limiting nuclear weapons. And we have to remember this is actually the last main arms control arrangement we have. Not many years ago, Russia violated the INF Treaty, banning all intermediate range weapons. That led to the demise of that treaty, and now the last important uh, arms control arrangement is the new uh, uh, start and, uh, and uh, President Putin made it clear a few days ago that Russia has suspended their participation in the new uh, start uh, agreement. So over the last years, Russia has violated key arms control agreements, dismantling the whole arms control architecture. So we have to recognize that the end of this war will not be a return to normal in our relations with Russia. There is no going back. In a more dangerous world, we can no longer afford to treat defense as optional. It is a necessity. Yes, I know that it's hard to spend more on defense. Because when you spend more on defense, it's less for something else. It's less money for education, for infrastructure, for health, for all the other things we feel it's more meaningful to, to invest in than defense. So when we spend more on defense, there is less money for other important tasks. But nothing is more important than our security, and that's the reason why we have to invest more in defense. I also therefore welcome the fact that almost all NATO allies have now plans uh, in place to spend 2% of GDP on defense, and uh, that an increasing number of allies see 2% as a floor, not a ceiling, uh, for defense spending. The third lesson is that we need to strengthen the resilience of our societies. Military forces are necessary to protect our security, but they are not enough. Strong societies and robust economies are our first line of defense. So we must secure our cyberspace, supply chains and critical infrastructure. The war in Ukraine has demonstrated the danger of being over-dependent on authoritarian regimes. Not so long ago, many argued that importing Russian gas was purely an economic issue. It is not. It is a political issue. It matters for our security. Europe's dependency on Russian gas made us vulnerable. We should not make the same mistake 
uh, with China and other authoritarian regimes. We must not become too dependent on products and raw materials we import or export key technologies that could be used against us. And we must protect our critical infrastructure at home. Of course, we should continue to trade and engage economically with China, but economic interests cannot outweigh our security interests. We know that Beijing is watching closely what happens in Ukraine. The price Russia pays or the reward it receives for its aggression. So what's happening in Europe today could happen in Asia tomorrow. Our security is not regional, our security is global. Let me then end with a few words uh, about Finland and Sweden's NATO membership. First, I would like to commend and praise um, Sanna Marin and uh, Magdalena Andersson for their political leadership, uh, because they actually demonstrated a political leadership courage when they led their countries to make the historic decision to apply for membership uh, in NATO. And then all NATO allied, uh, allies made uh, an historic decision uh, when we uh, decided to invite Finland and Sweden to join at our summit in Madrid uh, in, uh, uh, in June last year. So far, this has been the fastest accession process in NATO's modern history. Finland and Sweden applied in May last year. All NATO allies invited you to join at the Madrid summit in June. And uh, 28 out of 30 allies have already ratified the accession protocols. Completing Finland and Sweden's accession to NATO is a priority for NATO. I had good discussions with President Erdogan uh, in Ankara recently, and we are making progress. I have made clear that both Finland and Sweden have delivered on the commitments in the trilateral memorandum agreed with Turkey at the NATO summit, and that the time has come to finalize the ratification process. I'm glad that President Erdogan agreed to restart discussions, and I will convene another meeting of the permanent joint mechanism at NATO headquarters next week. I also expect that the Hungarian parliament will complete ratification shortly. Finland and Sweden's application to NATO have already strengthened your security. You are sitting at NATO's table and integrating into our political and military structures. NATO has increased its presence in the region. We are exercising more together and many allies have given Finland and Sweden security assurances. So it is inconceivable that NATO allies would not act if your security was threatened. So friends, NATO is a big family of 30 free nations across Europe and North America, soon to be 32. We represent half of the world's military might and half of the world's economic might. And we provide security guarantees like no one other, one for all and all for one. Bringing the Nordic family together around NATO's table will make Finland and Sweden safer. Our alliance stronger and the whole Euro-Atlantic area more secure. So I look forward to welcoming you both as soon as possible. It is time to finalize the process and to have Finland and Sweden as full members of our alliance. And then I look forward to our discussion and to continue to be uh, together with this great family. Thank you.